Hello there. It's been longer than I would have hoped, but I hope you'll enjoy this first part in a multi-part series on communalism. If you find this video enlightening, please do subscribe. Uploads will be more consistent from now on, and I will have an actually consistent work and school schedule. But with that out of the way, let's get right into the video. Communalist Theory Part 1 Bookchin's Philosophy of Nature What is nature? In Bookchin's mind, there are two dominant answers to this question that both fail to be proper, workable conceptualizations of nature. The first is the view that nature is wilderness. It is everything that is inhuman or unaltered by humans. Nature is picturesque views of waterfalls and rainforests unsullied by a meddling humanity. Nature is whatever it is that is being destroyed by human oil spills and encroached upon urban expansions. The second framework sees nature as all that exists in the material world. Whatever is made of matter is for all intents and purposes natural in this point of view. A flourishing rainforest or an ever-expanding urbanity neither has any exclusive claim to being natural. Both are the consequences of atomic processes of no greater or lesser significance than the other. In The Philosophy of Social Ecology, Bookchin writes on how people would respond to the question of what nature is, saying, Today, this sort of question is likely to elicit a heated avowal that only wild, primordial, or even non-human nature is authentically natural. Other people, no less thoughtful, will reply that nature is basically matter or the materialized stuff of the universe in all its forms. These differences remain unresolved to this day, even as nature is making headlines in environmental issues that are of enormous importance for the future of nearly all life forms. In the communalist analysis, this incoherence in contemporary views of nature is the consequence of an over-reliance on analytical reasoning. A reasoning which seeks to define things in static, quasi-mathematical terms, regardless of whether or not this is appropriate. The wilderness outlook of nature sees it as a static image of the non-human. It somehow ignores the reality that human beings emerge out of nature, instead of viewing us as aliens to it. This view is based on an incoherent intuition that has been thoroughly captured in a culture dominated by the harsh static thinking of conventional reasoning. To make it worse, this view is often used as a tool of misanthropic propaganda, largely hoisted on the backs of an illusory, unified humanity, which is destroying the wonderful wilderness of the world as a team. One need only look at such phenomena as the voluntary human extinction movement to see some of the nearly genocidal implications of this outlook. The vulgar materialist approach, while logically sound, is so reductive as to be essentially useless. Within this paradigm, a total nuclear winter couldn't be said to be any more harmful or beneficial to nature than a regenerated rainforest. It is this outlook which largely serves to justify any and all practices done by massive pollution centers, usually those created by our new industrial barons. By reducing nature to the motion of atoms, we lose the ability to talk about it reasonably. Despite occupying the opposite end of the spectrum, this outlook is also the product of a static view of nature, brought about by conventional reason. Indeed, one could say it is the natural consequence of such a logical train of thought, but it nonetheless seems hollow. The first step towards the communalist philosophy of nature is to move beyond the static realm of conventional reasoning. The communalist outlook on nature instead is dependent on dialectical reasoning. Conventional reasoning is largely based on harsh categorization, where A equals A is the root of all notions. While it is certainly not without its uses, it can fall short in the realm of change and development. Dialectical reasoning, by contrast, is capable of dealing with development and contradiction. Bookchin writes, Dialectical reason, unlike conventional reason, acknowledges the developmental nature of reality by asserting in one fashion or another 
that A equals not only A, but also not A. Dialectical reason grasps not only how an entity is organized at a particular moment, but how it is organized to go beyond that level of development and become other than what it is, even as it retains its identity. The contradictory nature of identity, notably that A equals both A and not A, is an intrinsic feature of identity itself. It is precisely this kind of reasoning that is at the base of communalist philosophy, which is premised on a developmental, indeed, dialectical view of nature. To the communalists, nature isn't a static thing that can be understood by the terms of effectively mathematical reason, but rather a set of tendencies in the material world. Namely, communalists see nature as the material world's tendencies towards higher degrees of complexity, diversity, self-consciousness, and self-direction. The tendency from the inorganic to the organic, from the organic to the biological, and from the biological to the social is what constitutes nature. Bookchin called this philosophy dialectical naturalism, and it is a central pillar of the communalist outlook. Dialectical naturalism is based on a graded continuum of being and becoming, the kind of continuum that actually exists in objective reality. From this perspective, communalism approaches the development of nature, human society, and how they are connected to one another. First and second nature, the development of a human nature. Despite its logical incoherence, the intuitive view of nature, which views it in terms of wildness and inhumanity, communicates a need to understand how humanity relates to nature. It's an unrefined communication of the idea that humanity seems to find itself at odds with the natural world. This is evident in the increasing intensification of the ecological problems we're faced with. Communalism gives rational coherence to this intuitive outlook through its theory of first and second nature. First nature is understood as the realm of natural evolution. Its most obvious form is that which is seen in the realm of ecology. Evolution is a process of accumulation and differentiation that has resulted in a massive diversity of species and ecosystems. A peculiar aspect of the history of evolutionary development is that it not only appears to trend towards diversity, but also towards greater degrees of self-consciousness and self-directivity. This has reached its highest point in human beings. The traits imparted to humans by first nature give us a potential for self-direction and self-consciousness not paralleled anywhere else in the animal world. Whereas most animals primarily adapt to their environment with some sparse applications of innovation, humanity is unique in being able to innovate and create its own environment through the application of speculative potential given to humans by their evolutionary heritage. It is this fact of humanity that allows for the development of what Bookchin called second nature. In humanity's history, there has been a gradual process wherein biological differences are transformed into institutions and cultural forms. These institutions have continued to develop into very different forms over time, in a cumulative and graded manner. There are no harsh breaks, but rather transformations of certain forms into others. Warrior societies turn into chiefdoms, which turn into kingdoms, which develop into empires, and so on and so on. In each case, the old fosters the forms that develop into the new. This creates a realm of social evolution that is distinct from biological evolution. We call this realm second nature. This second nature never entirely breaks from first nature. Such a notion is fundamentally absurd. Instead, there is a gradual phasing of one from the other. Humanity is increasingly directed by cultural forms and institutions rather than biological differentiation. However, this process of social evolution is in and of itself rooted in the tendency of first nature towards greater degrees of self-direction. Second nature is the highest expression of the tendencies in the very first nature it's been phasing itself out of, though its inherent subjectivity and self-directivity still make it distinct. 
This view of human society as something that gradually phases itself out of first nature, without ever truly departing from it, starkly contrasts from the view that nature is simply the domain of wilderness, that humans are aliens to, or that nature is simply whatever that is that exists. In Social Ecology and Communalism, Bookchin writes, Human beings always remain rooted in their biological evolutionary history, which we may call first nature, but they produce a characteristically human social nature of their own, which we may call second nature. Far from being unnatural, human second nature is eminently a creation of organic evolution's first nature. To write second nature out of nature as a whole, or indeed to minimize it, is to ignore the creativity of natural evolution itself, and to view it one-sidedly. From this view of nature, which is born out of communalism's dialectical approach to understanding historical development, we can further develop a basis for an ecological ethics that allows us to critique that which is and points us towards the characteristics of that which should be. Ecological Ethics from second nature to free nature. In the communalist analysis, ethics are derived from a rational what should be rooted in the potentialities of that which is. In other words, communalism forms its ethical evaluation based on whether or not a society expresses the fulfillment of objective collective human potentialities. In the same way, a gardening method is evaluated in terms of its ability to foster the development of the seed into the flower, thus fulfilling its potentialities, dialectical naturalism examines society in terms of its fulfillment of humanity's natural potentialities. In The Philosophy of Social Ecology, Bookchin states, Dialectical naturalism's objectivity is ethical by its very nature, by virtue of the kind of society it identifies as rational, a society that is the actualization of humanity's potentialities. It sublates science's narrow objectivity to advance by rational inferences drawn from the objective nature of human potentialities, a society that increasingly actualizes those potentialities. And it does so on the basis of what should be, as the fulfillment of the rational. The human potentialities of concern to the communalist are those that are consistent with the tendencies identified in nature, the tendency towards diversity, self-determination, self-consciousness, and complementarity. The communalist ethics is based on the potentiality for humans to become nature-made self-conscious on a societal level. In Remaking Society, Bookchin identifies these potentialities, saying, The capacity to be rational and free does not assure us that this capacity will be realized. If social evolution is seen as the potentiality for expanding the horizon of natural evolution along unprecedented creative lines, and human beings are seen as the potentiality for nature to become self-conscious and free, the issue we face is why these potentialities have been warped and how they can be realized. It is part of social ecology's commitment to natural evolution that these potentialities are indeed real and that they can be fulfilled. It is this outlook which forms the ethical core of the critical and utopian elements of communalism. Second nature, as defined above, has failed as of yet to fulfill human potentialities. Instead of tending towards greater degrees of self-direction and diversity, it tends towards greater control and uniformity. As of yet, the social evolution of second nature has put humanity at odds with first nature. Rather than helping foster the developments of first nature, we are actively erasing them. We have created a globalized mass society that threatens not only other flora and fauna, but threatens to destroy the very project of civilization in and of itself. In the dialectical naturalist outlook, it is the very contradictions that exist within second nature that have put it in a condition of contradiction with first nature. If it were to be achieved, the resolution of these contradictions will give rise to, to a new realm of pre-nature, the birth of an ecological society. In the minds of communalists, 
Free nature would be premised on a society of free humans who would take an active and constructive role in first nature. This would be the fulfillment of human potentialities. Instead of simplifying the social and natural environments to the point where they become increasingly incapable of sustaining complex life, as we are doing today, humanity would foster diversity in both realms for the mutual flourishing of all of the planet's inhabitants. This is premised not on a passive outlook towards nature, but rather a philosophy of direct intervention. Bookchin writes, We have reason to speak of a relationship between human and human, and between humanity and nature, that will transcend the pristine first nature from which a social second nature emerges, and will open way to a radically new free nature, in which an emancipated humanity will become the voice, indeed the expression of a natural evolution, rendered self-conscious, caring, and sympathetic to the pain, suffering, and incoherent aspects of an evolution left to its own, often wayward, unfolding. Nature, due to human rational intervention, will thence acquire the intentionality, power of developing more complex life forms and capacity to differentiate itself. Fundamentally, communalists desire a world where, instead of seeking our own destruction, humans use their great capabilities to foster both social and natural good. Conclusion In summary, communalism's philosophy is based on a developmental or dialectical view of nature and humanity's place in it. Rather than viewing it as a fixed wilderness that humans ought not meddle in, nature is instead seen as a realm of continuous, cumulative development towards rationality, self-consciousness, diversity, and freedom. Human beings are products of that evolutionary trajectory and express the highest forms of each of these traits. Through the development of a distinct second nature of social evolution, humans have created a realm of human creativity and innovation that is both different from, but granted by, evolution. However, this realm of second nature has, as of yet, failed to actually realize human potentialities. Instead, it has actually fostered both social and natural decline through a rapid process of simplification of both the natural and social world. Communalists desire and actively work towards the remaking of society along lines that should fill human potentialities and consequently release the tension between first and second nature. A socially liberated humanity would become a force of self-direction towards differentiation in the natural world. This would result in a liberatory sublimation of second nature into first nature referred to communalists by the term free nature. I'm sure there are many questions that emerge from this reading. In part two of this series, I plan to go into more depth on the development of second nature, how that development puts second nature at odds with first nature, and how that tension has created a unique revolutionary potential in the 21st century. By talking about the second pillar of communalism, its scientific analysis called social ecology, which relates the philosophy described here to a coherent analysis of history and society. For now, I hope you enjoyed this piece, and I look forward to seeing you again in part two.